didn't take it too seriously. We were hoping that we're going to survive as a family. However, once the trains arrived and we were taken out to the stations and we were thrown into these cattle cars, as many as 80 or 100 people in one of these cattle cars, we were given a 50 gallon drum for sanitation purposes and a couple of buckets full of waters and they slammed the door. At that moment, we realized that our life will change. No more natural childhood, no more natural life as existed prior. The transportation, we had young children, old people with us. The transportation took anywhere from four to eight days to get to taken out to Poland. The reason, because at that time, the Russian war was on, Hitler was fighting in going into Russia, so the train stations, many times they were busy and they let us even stay on the stations waiting there with the train. Uh, the door were never opened. Babies were crying, babies were suffocating, people stepping on the babies and the old people. It was horrible. I, it's, I it's, cannot describe what went through in this transport. Finally, we arrived to Auschwitz. Auschwitz is in Poland. The doors opened up. Then we know, we knew what is a concentration camp. Not paradise like the propaganda said that we're gonna to be together with our families. We were shoved out, thrown out from this railroad, uh, from the cattle cars. The dead bodies were thrown out also. And we seen some of these people in a striped uniforms. We really didn't know what's happening. Later, we found out that the Slav uniforms, they were also concentration camp inmates. They were taken out earlier, mostly from Poland or Czechoslovakia or other countries which was occupied prior than Hungary or Romania. After we were thrown out from this train, we were also there were German soldiers with uh, dogs barking at us fighting some of the people. Then we were made to stay in line. And in line, at, I was still together with my family at that time in the line. And as we approached in the line, we were heading in front of this infamous Dr. Mengele. Dr. Mengele was an actual medical doctor. It's hard to believe a medical doctor who was supposed to save life. And in front of him, we would have to stay and he had a stick in his hand and with a stick in his hand he points uh, to the left or to the right and he was like god if you went to the wrong side you were taken immediately to the crematorium i remember that my mother was holding on to my grandmother who was a little bit older in front of Dr. Mengele, my mother could have gone to the right side, but being that she didn't left off her grandmother, or her mother, she was taken on the left side and taken immediately to the crematorium. Myself, that I was 17 years old, uh, I looked pretty healthy. I was chosen to stay alive, to do hard labor. The procedure after the marching was pretty much the same for the people who were taken to the crematorium or to the people who were going to survive and do hard labor. The procedure was that we were taken into a huge room. We were supposed to be undressed, take all our clothing off. We were shaved, all parts of your body, chest, hair, and so on. Everything was shaved, your head. Then we were taken into a shower, a huge room with shower heads on top of it. We didn't really knew what the, the difference between a shower where water comes out or a shower where cyanide gas comes out. Find out later that the people who were going to crematorium, they were shoved into this room and instead of uh, water, cyanide gas was thrown into it. Uh, some people uh, were not even dead, especially the children, because they were pretty much to the floor. And then they were taken out, 
and taken right next door into the crematorium and they were burned. In my situation, water came out. After that, we were going, taken out from this room. We were given a striped uniform. Under the uniform was no underwear, no t-shirt, just a flimsy striped uniform. Shoe, if you're lucky enough, you might have get a pair of uh, wooden shoes or a cap. If not, you just had this uniform on. As we entered the camp, we usually have to stay in line and watch people being hanged. There were a so-called hanging tree. It's daily, daily we people were hanged. They were hanged four or five at a time. They said that this is what happens if you sabotage in the factory or if you try to escape. But to escape was really, really impossible. We had this type uniform on. And we have the number on our arm, tattooed on our arm. We were always shaved, and we were too weak to even escape. The, the camp was surrounded with electrified wire. Many people chose the way out to get over it. Usually they didn't even reach the wires because there were uh, towers with machine guns, and if you tried to reach the wire, you were shot down. Uh, life in the camp was very, very miserable. We heard the machine guns, the, 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 we knew the war is coming to an end. This is the first time the Germans opened up the kitchen. We didn't, couldn't realize it. I remember it was at night, midnight sometime. The sirens was on and the guns outside and they yelled everybody out from the, from the barracks, everybody out and your kitchen door is open. You can take food what you want and blankets and so on. This was January and if you really know that in Poland, which is deep east, the winter is very cold. So I went to the kitchen, I took a blanket, wrapped around myself, took another blanket, put in a bunch of canned food, beautiful canned food, put them on my back, and we started the death march. I'm one of them who was involved in the so-called death march. This is how I went up in different camps. We were marching four or five days, and as we were marching to camp, to another camp, finally I wanted to eat. I realized I have canned foods. I took the can, but we had no can openers. We had no rocks because the snow was very hot. So we had to throw away the cans so we couldn't even eat the beautiful canned food that Germans let us have. This time again, we were marching with soldiers alongside us, no more dogs. There were soldiers with guns, with rifles. If you stepped out one line, you were shot. The road was lined up with bodies. I understand that we were started out like 20,000 of us to start that march. And each time we go into different camps, we stayed a few days and we marched further. I marched from Poland, from Auschwitz. Finally, I find out that my last camp was Sachsenhausen, which is pretty close to Berlin. And after, as they moved Sachsenhausen out, the reason we did this march because they did not want us to be liber liberated. Whether they wanted to kill us more or they were uh, hiding us, trying to show that we really didn't have that many people died, but we were not allowed to liberate. Finally, when I reached after Sachsenhausen, we were in no man's land and the guns, we heard the guns, we know the war is coming very close to an end. They gave us a resting period outside uh, on the side of the road, and there was woods around it. So I went into the woods, and we thought we were going to stay there overnight. Within hours, they were yelling again, entreat and water, water machine, meaning that everybody get out, and we have to go for marching further. Well, I could not get up anymore. I probably weighed maybe 60 pounds, 70 pounds, something like that. 30. Uh, so I couldn't come out. I just remained in the woods there. And uh, I thought I was alone. But uh, early in the morning, we heard a big, I heard a big uh, heavy artillery and heard a tank and trucks. And I thought, well, the Germans coming back and that probably be the end, the end of it. Then I looked out and I seen the big, big tanks with uh, red stars on us. So I realized it was the Russian army. The Russian army just coming in and there was a final march into Berlin. 
So we were about 15 miles. So I went to the Russian, and I realized that we were about 10 of us had the same idea we couldn't walk. So I went to the Ru we Russians, because we had a couple of Polish people with us who spoke Russian a little bit, and we asked them to help us, give us food or something. And the Russians said, no, we don't have any food. You see, the Russian army were not supplied like the Allies. They did not have kitchens, everything behind them. They said, we are in the war. We are the tanks was turning around and setting up everything towards Berlin. So he said, we just passed a little town. You go ahead and have some food. So we, I couldn't walk. As a couple of them were strong enough, they went into the, to the uh, little town there and uh, went to the farm as there was food even at the table. That's how fast the Russians came in. There was hot food sometime on the table. They, had, they left it and went away. And we organized a little group, eight, uh, 11 of us, and a couple of them went in to get food. Uh, I know, I remember the farmers didn't want to give up their food. And we told them we are survivors, and we had to get the Russians' help to give us food. And once we got a little bit uh, uh, better on my feet, I, we marched into Berlin. The war was over then, and we decided to, that's how I survived. I survived in no man's land. I'm just lucky. I mean, the reason to surviving and the reason to go to concentration camp is just a matter of being the right time, the right place, and being lucky to survive. <laughs>